Hello and welcome back to Talking Europe. I'm Armand Georgian. I'm pleased to welcome today the EU Commissioner for European Neighbourhood Policy and Enlargement Negotiations, Johannes Hahn. He was previously EU Commissioner for Regional Policy and before that Minister of Science and Research in the Government of Austria. In a varied career, Mr Hahn has been active in regional politics, in business management and a leading figure in the centre-right Austrian People's Party. Welcome to the program, Mr. Hahn. Hello. Let's start with the European Neighbourhood Policy. This was launched in 2003 to bring prosperity and stability to Europe south and east. But if you look at many places, Libya, Egypt, Israel, Palestine, the South Caucasus, it doesn't seem to have worked out particularly well. Well, I mean, uh, 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 geography is destiny. We have our neighbors in the east and the south, and uh, I think our challenge is to have a, a sound and, and, and correct and ideally friendly relations. And uh, my aim is to strengthen our neighbors uh, to invest in their uh, economic development, uh, to, because I think this is the, the best guarantee to have more resilience. And if you have more resilience, you can also work on a further democratic uh, development. And uh, in that respect, I think we have been quite successful. But uh, there is no doubt that uh, we are facing many challenges uh, uh, in the east, in the south. Uh, but this is, uh, so to say, part of our daily business. But of course, when you see new crises erupting, as they did in eastern Ukraine, as they did in Libya or in Egypt, the EU doesn't seem to have... Uh, that much uh, power of attraction or, or, or power as a role model to make those countries more like what Europe would want them to be? Do you think that's something that's grown as a problem perhaps since the late 90s or early 2000s when this program was launched? No, I, I think it's important to recall that Europe is uh, seen by, by many uh, people, uh, mostly outside the European Union, as a soft power. We are very attractive. Many people want to come to Europe. Uh, we see this every day. And uh, soft power means that we don't uh, achieve results from one day to the other day. But uh, we can achieve a lot and we have achieved a lot. I mean, if I look at uh, Ukraine, if I look at Georgia, other countries, uh, even if I look in Tunisia, uh, Tunisia or in the Western Balkans, we have stabilized, we have improved the economic performance and we have, uh, uh, so to say, calmed down some societal tensions, uh, but we couldn't manage the, everything uh, at the, in, in a way that everybody says, OK, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But I think we are on the right uh, path and uh, it will certainly be off uh, very soon. Nonetheless, some criticisms have increased over the last few years about the neighbourhood policy. People saying it's too broad. There are too many countries in this 16 nations. Is there an argument for a reset to narrow it down and perhaps have a more targeted approach to a smaller number of countries. Yeah, neighbor stays neighbor. And uh, <laughs> I cannot, uh, uh, so to say, differentiate between, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if they are in our neighborhood, they are in our neighborhood. Sure. But uh, what we have done is uh, two years ago to revise our policy. And uh, what we have introduced are four key elements. And one of them is, so to say, um, that we are looking for a kind of tailor-made uh, cooperation with our neighbors because there are some neighbors in particular in the east which have a european aspiration others are more distant uh, the south they can't become member of, of the union but there are also different levels of engagement with us mm -hmm. and in that respect uh, we have uh, uh, shaped our uh, way of cooperation uh, respecting our interests, but also trying to match the interests of our partners. Let's talk about that tailor-made cooperation in respect of a particularly important country for uh, your brief, and that is Ukraine. Of course, you went to Ukraine uh, in July of this year, and actually your boss, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, the president of the commission, he told the Ukrainian president that Kiev was not tackling corruption quickly enough. What do you think the remedy should be? Should the EU take a uh, a harder line, perhaps threatening to with, withdraw, I'd rather withhold some of its financial aid in the future? Uh, this is a very good example uh, about, so to say, the soft power of, uh, of the European Union. Um, Ukraine and the Ukrainian citizens were eager to get visa liberalization. And in order to get visa liberalization, we introduced uh, 144 criteria which have to be fulfilled. 
And the last one, which took uh, a couple of months to be uh, implemented or fulfilled, was an electronic asset declaration by, um, uh, to be done by politicians, but also by senior civil servants, in order to declare in public what are their assets. And if they are not uh, declaring this correctly, they are facing severe uh, punishes, punishments. And this has uh, triggered, uh, so to say, a lot. And at the same time, we have started together with the Ukrainian uh, uh, government to modernize the judiciary, uh, to, 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 so to say, to look into the quality, into the performance of judges, also, so to say, in their to, to wet their, 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 their life, if you like, and to see which of them could stay also in the future as judges. And we have increased the salary of judges so that there is no reason to take any money from anybody. But this takes time. But in the meantime, we have it. It starts to pay off. But it's not something we can achieve from one day to the other sure. day. But the aim is to have it in a very sustainable, lasting way. A, a, a very different situation, but one that you've been involved with is Turkey, of course, and you were there in July as well. You visited the country. Um, do you get a sense now that uh, it's basically over in terms of accession negotiations and really the EU should look at a fundamentally different relationship now? What is obvious is that uh, the country is uh, backsliding uh, from the European perspective, and uh, this not only since the attempted coup d'etat, but also already before, since a couple of years. And um, uh, this is why uh, the foreign ministers in December last year have clearly stated and decided uh, not to, under the current, uh, I think if I quote rightly, under the current uh, prevailing circumstances, uh, no new chapters uh, concerning uh, negotiations uh, uh, for our future accessions should be opened. And this is where we are. Yeah. What do you think an alternative relationship with Turkey could look like concretely? Well, there are many areas of possible cooperation and in, in some areas we are already working very successfully together, for instance, in the, in the common fight against uh, terrorism, uh, <clears throat> on energy, on an economy in general. Uh, we are just discussing uh, an upgrading of customs union uh, because for us it should be important uh, to stabilize the country also in its... Uh, economic situation because it's a very important neighbor for us and it uh, makes a difference how the country looks like if you like in also in economic and financial terms we are working i think very successfully on the migration uh, issue together but that that working on together on that issue means that the eu can't criticize as much as it would another country that it didn't have that migration deal with if it were faced with a similar situation of a huge purge with 150,000 people at least being fired from their jobs. I mean, that's the common criticism of, of the EU's approach no. there. I mean, if you follow our statements, uh, reports, etc., we were always very critical. Why? Uh, Turkey has decided to become a candidate country to the European Union. And as a candidate country, they have to accept that we have to apply the higher standards when assessing uh, the situation of rule of law independent of judiciary, uh, uh, democratic developments, etc. So we are very clear on that, of course. On the other hand, there are areas where we have to cooperate, like we do it with many other countries around the world. Mm. Just a quick question about the Western Balkans, because it doesn't get that much attention in, in the Western media. Uh, you were telling me before before we started, that there's a very different level of development among those different countries. Does that pose, in your view, a real threat to the stability of the European Union? <clears throat> uh, um, no, but uh, what uh, we have to see and to understand, and I think this is uh, common sense amongst uh, the European politicians, is that uh, if we would like to have a, a lasting, uh, uh, peaceful development in the region, this is only achievable if there's a European perspective for all these countries. But this is not something we can achieve from one day to the other. That's why I prefer to speak about the process uh, and not only about negotiations. And indeed, the, the countries uh, are, so to say, on different levels uh, concerning the European 
development, the European perspective. But important is that all of them have a clear perspective and it's now up to them how fast they are in their development. So, Commissioner Hahn, I'd like to ask you about uh, a bit more about the migrant issue. Emmanuel Macron, the French president, has just been visiting Greece. He's been talking about Eurozone reforms, but also, of course, among other things, the issue of hotspots for processing migrants. You've had a lot of experience of this. Tell us about what works and what doesn't work uh, with these hotspots. Hopefully, I have uh, two or three minutes. But <laughs> the point is, migration is the challenge of the 21st century. So, of course, we are facing an unprecedented high number of migrants, or we have faced in, in the Western Balkan, and we are still doing this in the Mediterranean. Uh, and uh, therefore, we have not really an experience how to deal, or we didn't have an experience how to deal with it. And in that respect, I think trial and error is something which is um, um, necessary to apply, uh, because what we are developing now is something we can use in the future. It's like creating uh, and, and, and building a toolbox for accommodating with such challenges we will face also in the future if I take the number of uh, possible people in Africa in the next uh, couple of years and uh, the doubling of inhabitants in Africa and, and, and in other countries. So migration will be the huge challenge of the 21st century, uh, globally spoken. And therefore, we have to test out what are adequate um, uh, measures uh, first to differentiate between migrants and refugees. And uh, the huge number of people which try to change from one country to the other are migrants and not refugees. Refugees can ask for asylum and they will get it. Migrants, most likely not. And this is exactly why we try to have centers yeah. where people can be checked, where we can talk to people, where we can tell them uh, at a very early stage. It's unlikely that you will get asylum in Europe or it is possible that you might get it. At some point, though, these concepts are going to have to be changed, aren't they? Because climate change will actually uh, probably modify the whole conception of a migrant versus a refugee. And you mentioned Africa before, the, the, the likely very big flows we're going to see in the next few decades. Indeed, uh, I think this is something we have to discuss on a, on a, on a, on a global uh, level, uh, what is, uh, so to say, a new definition of refugee, because our definition still stems from the time just after World War II and was definitely related to a war situation. But as you rightly said, uh, climate change could be a new reason to become a refugee if there are no alternatives. So this is something one has to discuss, but this is not something of uh, today and tomorrow. Today and tomorrow we have to deal with uh, the, let's call it migration wave towards Europe. When you look at the rise and fall, or I should say ebb and flow of uh, populist policies, politics in Europe in the last two or three years. Do you see any particular pattern? Are you optimistic or pessimistic about uh, the future of populist political parties, for example, in your in your own country in Austria? Well, um, if you take your country, if you take France, uh, we have seen, and if I take uh, my country, uh, the uh, presidential elections last year, I think uh, if somebody is uh, very clear, for instance, uh, on, on his European uh, perspective, this is something which is honored by people. It's about uh, transparency, it's about openness, it's about giving, so to say, uh, or presenting oneself with uh, a clear program. And then uh, I think uh, the huge majority of people is able to take the right decision because everybody understands in the meantime um, there is no alternative to the European uh, project and uh, the, the European Union. And of course, like every entity, we have to work on ourselves, we have to further develop, we have to, to accommodate with new challenges. So there's a work in progress. But the principal concept to work closely together and in particular uh, uh, under the new if you like, uh, a challenge of a globalized world, it's important to, to be together. I mean, we are 28 
And honestly, all the 28 are in comparison mm. to the global situation y of big countries. You, you were already very active in Austrian politics when there was a boycott, uh, of a diplomatic boycott of Austria in 2000, I think it was. Can you imagine that kind of situation happening again uh, today or rather in 2017? Within 17, 18 years, things have changed. In the meantime, we have seen many other uh, governments in Europe uh, where partly uh, the, uh, the members of the government, meaning the political parties, are much more populistic and so on. Mm. So uh, I think what is even more important is that uh, we are working together. We are focusing uh, on the European project which is something where everybody has to communicate to his or her people about this. This is not something which is only a subject or a task of a, a few European officials. It's uh, uh, something which is also, so to say, the task of national, regional and local politicians. In that respect, I think uh, your President Macron is an excellent uh, positive example for that. And I hope many others will follow him. We'll have to end it there. Thank you so much for uh, being uh, our guest on Talking Europe, uh, Johannes Hahn, EU Commissioner for European Neighbourhood Policy and Enlargement Negotiations. That's all for this edition of Talking Europe. Thanks for watching.